In our discussions of polynomial functions up to this point, we have corresponded the notion of graphs crossing the x-axis with zeros. And, and that's just fine as long as we're limiting ourselves to the real number line. That is to say that, that if we have a function that uh, has an x-intercept somewhere, then we say that corresponds to a zero of, of the function, it corresponds with a factor, and so on. Now, we want to expand the idea just a little bit, um, because although it's true that if we have a parabolic curve, for example, whose vertex is above the x-axis and which opens upward, we have no x-intercepts and therefore no zeros of the function in the real number system. That's true enough. However, if we expand our thinking to complex numbers, it'll turn out that there is a direct correspondence between the number of zeros in a function and the degree of the polynomial. And, and that's the essence of the fundamental theorem of algebra. The fundamental theorem of algebra, it sounds pretty auspicious, doesn't it? And by the way, there's a fundamental theorem of arithmetic. There is a fundamental theorem of calculus. There is a fundamental theorem of geometry, in case you're, you're wondering. But here's the fundamental theorem of algebra. It says that if, if f of x is a polynomial of degree n, where n is greater than 0, then, this should be then, f has at least one zero in the complex number system. And you expand the idea just a little bit and you find out that it has e exactly n number of zeros. That is, an nth degree polynomial function has exactly n zeros. Now we've talked already about the notion that zeros lead to factors. So this idea of n zeros in an nth degree polynomial function leads us to the linear factorization theorem which says that if f of x is a polynomial of degree n where n is greater than zero then that function has precisely n factors. So we have an nth degree polynomial function it has exactly n zeros and therefore exactly n linear factors. Now this tells us about the existence of those things, but it doesn't tell us much about how to find them. Our, our idea now is to go after them, is to, is to investigate for them. And we have already investigated using a number of techniques up to this point. Now let's talk about some of the nuances involved in just what we know here about the fundamental theorem of algebra and the linear factorization theorem. We know that just basically if we have a, a very simple function like this one, we can factor it and we can identify the zeros as the values of x that cause each factor to become zero. Okay, that's easy enough. Two zeros, second degree, two zeros, two linear factors. Now, look at this one. We have uh, x squared plus four. If we want the zeros of this, we set this expression equal to zero and solve for x. Well, we'll subtract 4 on both sides, and now x squared is negative 4, so x is plus or minus the square root of negative 4. But remember, we're talking about uh, imaginary numbers here as a result of taking the square roots of negatives, so we have plus or minus 2i as the values for x, as the zeros. Now, these then are our two zeros. We have identified the n number of zeros for this second degree uh, polynomial function. But what about the factors? Well, factors are related to zeros in that the factors are uh, x minus the zeros. So for 2i, the factor related to it is x minus 2i. For minus 2i, the factor related to it is x minus negative 2i or x plus 2i. So here are our two factors. Here's an interesting situation. It's cropped up in the past. We would have a function like this. We factor it. We see that the two factors are identical. The zeros are x equals 3 and x equals 3. Now in the past, we would say, gee, this only has one solution or one x-intercept. Well, that's true enough uh, in, in a sense, one distinct one. But really, it has two. It's just that, that, that this one has multiplicity two associated with it. You see, it occurs as a zero twice. And, and so there are two zeros. They just happen to be the same. And there are two linear factors, you see, that happen to be identical as well. 
Here's another situation, x to the fourth minus one. We begin the factoring process. x squared plus one times x squared minus one. This is the difference of two squares which factors easily uh, to x plus one times x minus one. We can identify the zeros associated with these two factors rather easily. But what about the zeros associated with this factor? Well, we would have to come out to the side and say, gee, I'd like to find out the value of x that will cause x squared plus one to be equal to zero. So we come over here and we do that. We say x squared plus one equals zero and then solve this for x. Well, subtracting one on both sides and then by the square root property, x is plus or minus the square root of negative one, but the square root of negative one is i. So we have plus or minus i. Now we slide back over here and so our, our various zeros are these two and then those two. That gives us then all of the factors. We, if we have four zeros, we have a fourth degree polynomial function, these are our four zeros, we should have four linear factors. And they would be, well let's see, we have two of them over here that are going to stay the same. But these, let's see, if, if i is a zero, then x minus i is a factor. And if minus i is a zero, then x minus minus i, or x plus i, is a factor. And I'll bring down these other two. So a fourth degree polynomial function, four uh, zeros, four linear factors. I do want to point out here, and we'll bring this up later, that the, the complex zeros happen to occur in conjugate pairs. That is, if, if plus i is a zero, then minus i is going to be zero. And, and we'll see that with uh, more sophisticated complex numbers shortly. Here we have a third degree polynomial function. We'd like to identify the three linear factors and also the three zeros associated with this function. We would begin the process by perhaps thinking, uh, what is f of zero? Well, when x is replaced with zero, these terms go out and we have negative 10. Now, f of 1 is pretty easy to identify, uh, just visually. If x is replaced with 1, we would have 1 minus 6 plus 13 minus 10. Collecting, we find that value to be negative 2. So 1 goes to negative 2. Then we would look at this little table and we'd think, well, let's see. 0 is at negative 10, 1 is at negative 2. The graph is sort of approaching the x-axis. Maybe we get some mileage by investigating at 2. Well, let's see. Uh, investigating synthetically, 2 in 2. Now, the 1, the negative 6, the 13, the negative 10. Let's see, bring down the 1, 2 times 1, 2. Together here, negative 4. 2 times negative 4, negative 8. Together, 5. 2 times 5, 10. And with negative 10, give 0. So we do indeed have a 0 at 2. So we have a 0 at 2. And x minus 2, then, is a factor. So we can go through and factor. And the leftover factor, we just read down here, this is 1x squared minus 4x, then plus 5. And now we would look to factor here. Well, we would investigate as we will, but we find out that we can't factor using the methods that we've been talking about. And so we need to, to find the zeros by using the quadratic formula. So using an a value of 1, b of negative 4, and a c of 5, we come over to the side and we apply the quadratic formula. Write the formula down, replace within it in the next step. Now notice that, that b is negative 4, so this is minus negative 4. You see the, the opposite of negative 4. Plus or minus, b squared is negative 4 squared. Minus 4 times a is 1, c is 5. In the denominator, 2a means 2 times 1. Now let's begin to evaluate. Minus negative 4 means 4, plus or minus. Now, under the radical, we get negative 4 when, we, when the smoke clears on that business. Now, the, uh, the, the square root of a negative number, well, we have to be a little cautious here. We're talking about imaginary, an imaginary value here, so our answers are going to be purely complex. All right, let's go through the process, though. The square root of negative 4 is, let's see, the square root of 4 is 2, and the square root of the negative 1 is i. So we have plus or minus 2i. Now, 2 divides both parts of this numerator, so we can simplify to 2 plus or minus i. Now, we've identified all of our zeros. Our zeros are 2 plus i, 2 minus i, and 2. You see, those are our zeros. But let's go through the, factored, the factorization. Now, the 2 plus or minus i zeros 
give us factors as x minus each of those. So if we want to write a factored form, then we're writing it this way. Now for the other zeros, it is x minus 2 plus i, x minus 2 minus i. Kind of getting jammed with this other problem here. Let me erase this. So that's the idea. And now we just simplify. We just clean up a little bit in those brackets. You see, and we, ju we can just drop the parenthesis, you know, change the sign, drop the parenthesis here. So this is x minus 2 minus i. And here is x minus 2 plus i as our three linear factors. And uh, notice that um, the, the complex zeros, the 2 plus or minus i, will kind of naturally, in the flow of things here, appear in conjugate pairs. And that is universally true, that complex zeros occur always in conjugate pairs. Here we have a third degree polynomial function and let's say we want to find the zeros and we're given one of them. We're given that 5 plus 2i is a zero. Now we have a third degree polynomial function so there are only three zeros to find and we know that uh, if, since we have a complex uh, zero that uh, complex zeros occur in conjugate pairs. So if 5 plus 2i is a zero then 5 minus 2i is also a 0. Now, there are actually two tactics that we can use to find that third 0. One is kind of a graphical and analytical uh, strategy where we begin the graph, we look for a certain crossing, and we use the techniques that we've talked about already. The other would be a purely algebraic uh, strategy where we, we reason this way. We think, well, Gee, if we have two zeros, then we know that we have a couple of factors, x minus that and x minus this are both factors. And if we have those factors, then hmm, the product of those two factors then would divide this polynomial evenly. And we could go through that division process. Now, either way we do it is okay. Let me backtrack just a minute, though, and, and mention something about this complex conjugate idea. That I, I mentioned, I said something to the effect that if, if we have one complex zero, then we have its conjugate as a zero. Actually, it's true that all of the zeros that we have found in this entire section and indeed in this entire uh, development of mathematics, they've all been in the set of complex numbers. It's just that when we mention something like a complex zero like this, it means that we have in this complex number, this a plus bi form, that the b value is not zero. Generally, we try to describe uh, numbers in certain sets in the most efficient way. If we were talking about a, uh, the number five, we might call it an integer or a natural number or something like that to, to narrow the set from which it comes. And, and here, when we talk about complex zeros, we're talking about a complex number, a number which has an imaginary part that's not zero. Okay, that, just to kind of clear that up. Okay, let's take that algebraic approach now. Here's what we know. We know that these two are zeros, so we know that x minus each of these is also a zero, and their product, you see, will divide that. That's the idea. So I'm going x minus and then 5 minus 2i. <coughs> now, to clear this up, we have, let's see, x minus 5 minus 2i and then x minus 5 plus 2i. There are actually a couple of ways to accomplish this, this uh, multiplication. We could think of ourselves as having a binomial minus 2i, bi same binomial plus 2i. So the sum and difference of the same two terms, you know, that, use that kind of strategy if we wanted to. But I'm going to use the old way, the, the, the kind of long way, where we just multiply every term here times every term there. So we would have, let's see, it's going to be a pretty long string of terms. x times x is x squared. Then x times minus 5 minus 5x. x times 2i is 
plus 2xi. Then minus 5 times x minus 5x. Minus 5 times minus 5 is 25. Minus 5 times 2i is minus 10i. And then minus 2i times all of these. Minus 2i times x minus 2xi. Uh, minus 2i times minus 5 minus 10 minus full plus 10i. And then minus 2i times plus 2i is minus 4i squared. Now I'm getting into this other problem here, but I think we can follow what I've got. It's kind of like here's a border. I'll erase it in a few minutes. All right, let's come back and collect some like terms. Let's see. I've got, I've got no other terms that are x squared, so I'll bring down x squared. We should get some nice cancellations here. Let's see if we don't. Minus 5x, minus 5x, that's minus 10x. I have no other x terms. Hmm. So minus 10x. Now to try to keep track of things, I've already used this one. I've used those two. Let's see. <clears throat> 2xi minus 2xi. Ah, good. They take each other out. We have 25 here. And we have minus 4i squared. Remember, i squared is negative 1. So we have negative 1 times negative 4. That's 4. So 4 and 25 is 29. So those terms go out. We have minus 10i plus 10i. Those take one another out. And here is our, our polynomial product. Now, it should be the case that this polynomial will divide that one evenly, and the quotient is going to be kind of a leftover factor that will give us that third zero. Okay, let's see if that's not the case. Now, I'm going to just erase up here. I need some room to do the, uh, the long division because we're dividing now a polynomial with three terms into a polynomial with four terms, so we can't use synthetic division. You see, that's out of play here. Synthetic division works with uh, first degree binomials with a leading coefficient of one, so we have some limitations there, but it's still a very powerful tool. Let me get rid of all of this stuff as well as I can. Okay. <coughs> so we're dividing x squared minus 10x plus 29 into all of this rascal. Now the division, if we've done our math correctly to this point, the division has to go evenly. I mean, just by the nature of the idea that we've been given two zeros, you know, and, and if we're, we're sure that that is the case, then this should go evenly. All right, we're dividing. Let's see, first term into first term here. We have x squared into x cubed goes x times, so I'll put the x here. And now I multiply back. x times x squared is x cubed. And then x times minus 10x is minus 10x squared. And then x times 29 is 29x. And then we draw the line and subtract, which means that we change signs and add. This situation is trivial. We, we're going to change this sign to plus, change this sign to minus. Let's see, 7x, minus 7x squared plus 10x squared is 3x squared. And then minus 29 with minus x is minus 30x. And then away we go with, the, with the, next, uh, the next part of the division. I'll bring down the next term, and here we go. We have x squared into 3x squared goes 3 times. So 3. Then 3 times x squared is 3x squared. 3 times minus 10x is minus 30x. And 3 times 29 is 87. And then we draw the line and subtract, changing the signs and collecting. We see that we have... Um, zero for our, our remainder here, as expected. So x plus 3 is that leftover factor, and x equals negative 3 is the third zero.